Double your defences by getting your COVID-19 and flu vaccines this winter. They're free for over 50s, those at clinical risk, pregnant women, carers, people with learning disabilities, as well as health and social care workers. Don't delay. Get both vaccines now. It's safe to have them both at the same time. Double your defences. Get vaccinated. Get protected. Go to nhs.uk to find out more. This is our People podcast telling the stories behind South Tyneside and Sunderland NHS Foundation Trust. Hello, my name is Fiona Thompson. I'm a communications officer with the Trust and today we are looking at the work of our alcohol care team. Um, I'm joined by uh, Rushin Burdis and Carly Hall. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, Rushin, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about your background and the role you have with the team? Yeah, um, so I've worked within the Trust since I qualified um, as a nurse and was a staff nurse on the gastro ward at South Tyneside. Um, I then became ward manager of the ward um, up until 2021 where I left and obviously started my role as lead for the alcohol care team. Um, obviously I've something that I've always been really passionate about working with this patient group which is why when I seen this role advertised that I thought that's the job for me. Brilliant and Carly what about you what's your background? My role is as the alcohol care team practitioner, so our support specialist nurses um, with the alcohol dependent patients. We offer brief interventions, psychosocial interventions at the bedside, harm reduction, referrals on with communities, and um, just to try to get an overall package of care to support the people who want support. Brilliant. And could you tell us a little bit about the setup of the team, how many members it has, and what kind of roles they have? Yeah, um, so there's myself as the lead, and then there's four alcohol specialist nurses two alcohol care team practitioners um, and there's an admin support um, who's starting with for next month which we're excited about and we've also got um, some additional roles to the team so we've got a recovery navigator based over at the South Tyneside site and we've just recruited into the role for the Sunderland site so hopefully we'll have a start for them soon. It's growing all the time. So the alcohol care team was set up in June 2021 and you've already become an award winner. So you picked up a um, NHS Parliamentary Award. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that um, achievement? Yeah, so um, the alcohol care team was set up in June 2021. Um, and obviously they were set up in hospitals that had um, high rates of alcohol admissions. Um, we were one of the early implementer sites for setting up an alcohol care team. And I think just obviously the fantastic work that the, and the things we'd achieved within the first year of going live we were obviously recognised for um, within the category of excellence for healthcare where we were regional winners and then went down to London for the um, award ceremony where we became highly commended in our category um, for obviously setting up the, the new service across two hospital sites working really closely with local partners and um, the local authority and commission services to make it really successful bridging the gap from primary care, secondary care in the community. What was the thing that sparked off launching the team? Um, so the NHS long term plan identified that it wanted um, to support hospitals to tackle um, alcohol, smoking, obesity and obviously Sunderland South Tyneside were outliers for some of the highest alcohol related admissions and deaths so we were one of the early um, implementer sites. Um, and Carly, you bring your own first-hand experience of addiction to your job. Um, would you like to tell us as much as you feel comfortable about that? Yeah, of course. So my um, journey with addiction and recovery probably started in early childhood um, in, term, in regards to the fact that my father was alcohol dependent. I became problematic substance user probably around the age of when I could afford to drink basically and when I could afford to take other substances that's when it really got out of hand so I firmly believe I've always had the makings to have those issues behavioural I was slightly different at school I was quite isolated quiet child that might be a reflection of what was going on at home but it it manifested in not, not very positive behaviours so as soon as I could afford to drink and take other substances I did and every time I did or found a new substance that would become massively problematic. Um, I had 
my first child at, I think it was 19. Um, so I was in a long-term relationship and that lasted for over 20 years. So the children have all got the same father. Um, bless him, he wasn't an addict in any shape or form and kind of tried to keep the family together. So we had a child early, I had a second child at 24, still reflectively looking back now, I was still really young, I think. Um, and sort of my passions and careers would have got a shell down low. I don't think I had the ability to say that through anyway because I was so problematic. Um, by the time I was 28, I was in my first rehab, first detox facility, which was the Hunter Home, which is long since gone. Um, not successful. I didn't do it for the right reasons. I did it because I was pushed into doing it. Um, I was working with services, but not really working with services, paying lip service. I would have periods of being alcohol free. Um, I would end up in mental health homes and they would detoxes. I'd end up in hospital, they would detoxes. But it, it was, there was nothing else really there. It was kind of a quick fix to a short, like a long term problem. It was a quick fix, a detox out, detox out, nothing really to follow up with that. So I didn't know what to do. Um, the last detox, I, I, so that went on, I didn't get clean so that I was. 38, sorry, I should say drug free. Um, the last detox I had, I've become not, a, I was probably up there among frequent attenders at South Tyneside Hospital. I lived opposite as well, which was probably not, not, not great. So I was one of those that would call an ambulance, turn up and discharge myself before seeing, turn up and discharge myself. I had alcoholic induced hepatitis, it was really poorly in the side room, um, really poorly, and I still went back out and drank because I had no after plan I had no after care um, I don't think anyone knew really what to do with this the children had long since been removed so that the, the, they'd been taken out of the case so I, I was in that cycle of I couldn't stop drinking for my children so what, I haven't got children now so what's the point of stopping drinking and I was told I had liver damage and all this type of thing as well so kept going kept going kept going round and round and round go in and out and, in and out and then the last time I think I had some kind of an epiphany but also the services had kind of got together and thought this is a young woman with young children who need to do something. I had a really supportive mother, supportive family, um, and I did have periods where I would try, but I just couldn't keep that momentum going. So I think the last time I went AD and, I, and the doctor said I'm sending home and I begged him, begged him to keep saying and he did. Um, and I, I never drank again. I never drank again, but I did have I had what was the hospital alcohol team at the time, they were there, mental health got on board because I'd, I had already had mental health issues but they were sort of exaggerated by the drugs and alcohol so they couldn't really work with us until I had a period of sobriety so people were really good at multi-agency work and then everyone got together around a table and, and said like look what can we do with this woman because my family were like what at the wit's end it was it was making my mother mentally ill the children are mentally ill um worried just living in complete fear so they had a program in place where the detoxes and the goddess would rehab unfortunately that rehab is no longer there but there are other options if you work with community services that have got the funding for detox and rehabs and it worked for me i'm not saying it's for everyone and it is a hard where you have to give up your mobile phone, you might not be allowed newspapers, it's kind of rebuilding your life again from the foundations upwards. But if you want it, it's available for you. So I do, if anyone's struggling with alcohol or drug addiction at this moment in time, I implore you to just start thinking about getting help, asking the right questions, doing the right things. No one's going to knock on your door and give it to you. So you need to kind of, you know, prioritise the recovery and go to your appointments. You know, start doing the right things, um, and it's 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 difficult, but it's the, the most worthwhile battle you'll ever win. And was there something in particular that just made you take that step forward that you hadn't taken before? I think I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. I was physically every time I drank, I would vomit. Every time I was doubly incontinent, it was emaciated because you don't eat when you drink. You just don't eat. It's not a priority. You can't eat. You can't get everything down. I had no hair. I was bald, and um, so I think. There was, there was no longer any reward from it. So the brain works on a reward system and I wasn't getting a reward anymore. So I think at that point I was like, that's it. When I went to rehab, I always said, I'm not giving drugs up. Never said I would give drugs up, but I had an excellent worker. So I think if you meet the most inspirational, motivational, the right person at the right time in your life, 
you can, they can do wondrous things with the, with the right people. And I, eventually I kind of admitted that overall I had problems with everything and I just needed to get used to having a, a clean head, which I've never had since I was probably about 14. So the um, right person came along to help you at the right time? The right services, every, it's really difficult. Some people probably can get sober and stay sober on their own, but what we do know is evidence-based that with the right support in place, you'll have a far better chance of success. So if you do come to South Tyneside or Sun Memorial Hospital and they ask if you want to speak to the alcohol care team and you've got a fleet moment of doubt about whether this is the life for you, just have a chat with her. Have a chat with her and see where we go from there. You know, not everyone's path is total abstinence. I have to be total abstinence because I was dependent, so I'll never drink like a normal person. And I've made peace with that. But some people might just drink a little bit more safely. They might put their shoes on and go to the shop. They might take their thiamine medication. They might attend GP appointments. It's not always the same path for everyone. And not everyone heals in the same way, but it is a worthwhile... Have the conversation. Yes, absolutely. Brilliant. And... Um, when you talk to our patients about your own experiences, how do they react to that? It can go either one or two ways. I don't know a share. I share if it's relevant to that person because it's not my journey we're talking about. It's their journey, and I think sometimes it can be like some people. If I mention my recovery to some people, it might become about me, and it's not about me. So a parent might, if we're talking with family, a parent might hang on to the fact that I recovered, but my journey and path is totally different from the, the patients. So. What I do like to do is when I go, you don't know what you're talking about, and I'll go, well, actually, I do. And they quite like it, they seem to quite like it, and they, um, they, they talk a little bit more, I would say, open up a little bit more. It, it's not always the, the, the winning formula, and having lived experience doesn't mean I know more than anybody else at all, but we've got a nice little group of different skill sets within the place that work well together to support the patient. But yeah, I tend to have a positive reaction to it. And were you inspired in your old because of your experiences? Is, yeah, is that how it came back? Yeah, a hundred percent, absolutely. And um, just wanted to give something back, and especially I think the ultimate goal was giving back to the NHS because I had been <laughs> long admissions, been in for a couple of weeks a week. I'm not that I can hundred percent remember, but I, I know I did frequent the hospital unnecessarily a lot of the time, but out of fear a lot of the time because you do think you're gonna die. Yeah, you feel like you're dying a lot of the time. It's a place of safety you clean, you fed, you water. So I get the pattern that people get into. It's not the right pattern, but I, I understand where they're coming from. But is it also a bit, how do you feel about walking into those places that you sought help from as well? It's great. So there's the doctor, the liver doctor, we used to refer to, the, the, all the drinkers used to refer, refer to ward three is the liver ward, because that's, I thought it was just for people with a bad liver. I didn't realize what type of ward it is, but everyone seemed to be in there with the same problem. So, um, it's in. I remember that the most of the staff don't remember. There's only a couple of members of the staff that I remember because I was, I wasn't really any bother. I was quite quiet on the wards, and I think that makes you less less memorable. But Doctor Topham was the doctor that looked after us, and she was re- she never gave up. Like she just never got angry with you. She didn't get frustrated with you. She was always just she treat you like a human being. I think that goes a long way because a lot of the time there is a lot of stigma around addiction and in repeat attendances to hospital because people do get fatigued and frustrated and staff members do because we want the best for you and it's difficult to to see people hurting themselves but Dr Topham was really important in my in my journey and actually as a colleague yeah 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 that's great um and Roisin what type at what point does the team become involved in um working with a patient and what do we offer them to help reduce their intake or address their long-term drinking so every patient that attends ad should be screened for their alcohol use and um, so regardless so, of what why you come in yeah so everyone should be asked um, about alcohol and smoking um, and obviously from once they've been asked about alcohol they can be offered a referral to the alcohol care team so we'll, we will see anyone with a audit c score of five and above um that could be high risk drinking um, or dependent drinking way we will see it, it depends what the person's presented with so it depends on the reason for presentation and will everyone will get a full assessment from one which would then advise us of what interventions might be appropriate whether it be a referral to community addiction services or it might be some harm reduction advice or 
grief intervention. It, it just depends on the person and the situation. So it's tailored. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and you've mentioned the audit C already. So, um, you use this. Uh, would you call it a table? What what would you refer to it as? It's a tool, it's I guess. Idea, yeah. An <laughs> identification tool. Yeah. Um, and so that talks patients through the alcohol that they drink. Why don't you take us through the questions? Um, talk about how they're scored and what happens when you meet certain levels and perhaps people who are listening can jot down their own scores and perhaps give them an insight into where they they, they are on this. Um, yeah, so Audit C is a universal tool. Uh, it's three questions with a scoring scale of zero to four and the total is out of 12. Um, so the first question is, how often do you have a drink containing alcohol? Never, which would be zero. Monthly or less, which would be one, two to four times a month, which would be two, and two to three times a week, which would be three. And if you drink more than four times a week, you would score four. The next question is how many units of alcohol do you drink on a typical day when you are drinking? And that ranges from one to two, which would be zero, three to four, which is one, five to six, which would be two, seven to nine, which would be three, and ten or more would be. Four. Is that 10 units? Yeah. Yeah. And then the last question is, how often have you had six or more units if you're a female or eight or more if you're a male in one occasion in the last year? Never been zero, less than monthly one, monthly two, weekly three, and daily or almost daily four. If you scored below five, you would be given a well done congratulations if you score in a five or above you could will be at an increasing risk so then you would be referred to us where we would ask you some further questions um, around your alcohol use and that forms the second section of the audit tool um, and then depending on that score that would indicate whether we needed to do an intervention whether it be um, brief intervention extended brief intervention or referral to community services right so people can have a think about where they would score on that and yeah might give them an idea of where they are yeah. people may be taken aback by the patients who we help can you tell us a little bit about the backgrounds of the people your team supports and yeah. um, so patients that are referred to us we it's anyone that attends ed with either an alcohol related admission or they are identified as alcohol dependent and um, patients that we've been seeing um, have ranged from um, a work and someone that holds down a full time job, working as a teacher, um, a cleaner, to someone that's homeless and um, has got no family or friends, um, has moved new to the area, um, experienced multiple disadvantages. Um, so it, it's really anyone, it could be me, you, your neighbour. Do you think people would be quite surprised with how many people might have a full time job and still have that issue with? drink yeah because obviously being alcohol dependent you don't have to drink as soon as you wake up and drink all day every day till you go to sleep you could get up and go to work and then have a drink when you finish work and so it's not what people think Um, and obviously we try and assess people to get a whole understanding a picture of what their behavior is with alcohol and substances and then that kind of guides us with what what interventions or support they're going to need. I think it's not what people years ago... It's not think. the bog standard stereotype yeah. of what, what an alcohol dependent person be, but there's le- different levels of alcohol dependency, like Rasheen says, some people can... For the body's a marvellous thing and homeostasis kicks in and somebody can wait at five o'clock on the dot and then at five o'clock on the dot and need that drink, you'll start withdrawing at that point. Normally, you can't sustain that and eventually you will become a 24-hour day dependent drinker. We're, we're trying to get the people before that point. We're trying to support people who are already at that point, but prevent and, and, and provide education to people who don't expect that. And because they'll go, well, I hold a full time job. Yes, but actually, still, you're doing this to your body, this could happen. So that that's, yeah. That's where I think at. a lot of when we're having conversations with patients is educating them and mm-hmm. even just 
getting people to acknowledge that there's risks around everything that they do and help reducing those risks, yeah. whether it be in have some more alcohol free days a week and mm -hmm. um, reduce the number of units that you consume in. Increase the um, yeah. yeah, so your diet, obviously mm -hmm. oral hygiene yeah. um, and people that are smoking fire and drinking safety, yeah, will do with fire safety. Thing. There's loads of different like harm reduction yeah. that we use to reduce the risks of heart, the risks to health and harm from alcohol use. We take a holistic approach, so we'll look at everybody, the, the, everything, the whole caboodle, caboodle, how we can address barriers to treatment, how we can support with certain things. We work with some more complex people than other people, um, that's why we work closely with PLT, Safeguard and Housing, because we, in domestic abuse, because we tend to find all of those things go hand in hand, um, but yeah, we've got a good, good mix of people that we work with. And so, what support do we offer patients once, once they've left hospital, because I know when they're in, they're in our care, you're there to talk to them and, and offer them all this, but what happens when they are discharged? So if the patient accepts, obviously we'll refer them to community alcohol services or a service that's appropriate to them um, and obviously we link in with them services and work with them really closely to be able to try and follow that on. Um, obviously we do offer some really ad hoc, um, not planned telephone support if, if needed um, and obviously obviously just working with the people that they're already working with in the community or referring them to services that can work with them like community outreach workers and um, charities all of that sort of stuff and just try and do some joint up work and just keep keep the the contact between mm -hmm. them and if they are readmitted to hospital does that flag something up at your end and you get in uh, touch with them and see how they're doing yeah so we would go and revisit them anyone that we attend and would kind of we do fresh eyes and it's again a new assessment so that we're not missing anything um, and assessing the person at that time and at that moment and if they're still working with all them people we'll go and contact them all to, to, to get everyone back on board or just have that phone call to make them aware are you aware this has happened that's happened and kind of increase that support for when they are discharged again. Um, and when we were talking about this conversation in advance you mentioned a condition called wernick Korsakov mm -hmm. syndrome, have I pronounced that correctly? Mm -hmm. I've not heard about that before, so could you tell us a little bit about that? Wernick encephalopathy is a neurological condition, an acute condition that's caused when people are thiamine deficient. Thiamine isn't produced by the body, it's something that absorbs through nutrients and when people are drinking lots and lots of alcohol, you're not getting the nutrients from the likes of cereal, wheat and grains. So when people come into hospital and they identify as alcohol dependent or high risk drinking, we would give them something called IV Pabronex, which um, is basically thiamine, but it gives their body a big boost of it to try and replace that depletion of thiamine. And then when they're discharged, they have an oral replacement that they would take, which would try and just keep them thiamine levels up. Um, obviously people that experience uh, vitamin B deficiency, which is what Wernix is, can suffer from a foggy memory, tiredness, um, a little bit of nystagmus. Um, What's nystagmus? Be, um, it's like a twitching in your eye. Ah, oh, right, okay. Um, and there's lots of issues that, that can come from that. If Wernix is left untreated, that can then develop into what we call Korsakoff's, which is a neurological condition that's more long-term. Um, so obviously it's something that we're really passionate in, making sure all the patients that we see get some Pabronex when they come into hospital. And um, even those that come into AED and leave quite quickly, it's still really important to give them the Pabronex and making sure that we're linked with our GP to get them the thiamine when they're in the community as well. And what, I know you mentioned kind of a, long, a longer term situation, what, what impact does it have on people when um, some people that have been diagnosed with Korsakoff's require like 24 hour care because it has long term damage to the, the frontal lobe um, the, 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 the tissue in their brain that's irreversible and can cause them to need like care which requires dressing, feeding, washing because I think when people think about others who we've seen had a long term drinking problem people like you said this, the, the, you made reference to the liver ward mm -hmm. that tends to be your first thought isn't it but yeah, 
It's, uh, it's not a condition I'd ever come across and I don't know whether many people have. This is not a part of your body that alcohol doesn't reach. It crosses the blood-brain barrier, it even causes problems with your, with, with your toenails and your feet. That isn't a part of your body, it doesn't touch. So yes, the liver um, is obviously what most people think of, but you're looking at diabetes, you're looking at cancer, cancers, oral, yeah, and, you know, oral cancers, especially stomach cancers. Um, Osteoarthritis, breast cancer is massive with women, and if the smoking with alcohol, that is the one of the biggest risk cancer risk factors for breast cancer. So yeah, the liver is a big concern, but like we say, the, that that's not the only thing that it can impact on. Um, and for anybody listening who wants to look to reduce their drinking or wants to support somebody, the loved one, uh, what advice would you start by offering them? And is there such a thing as a safe level of drinking? There's no official safe level of drinking. There's a safe air level, which is the government recommend guidelines, which is no more than 14 units of alcohol per week on a weekly basis. They recommend you have three to four days consecutive off a week. And um, that's suppose that's to allow the body to detox and to prevent any physical dependency in staying. Um, so whilst no there's not, obviously we have to be realists and understand people enjoy alcohol. Binge drinking classes, six units in one sitting, that's not a lot of alcohol that classes a bit, but that's the impact it has on your body. So the risk that the more alcohol you have, the more risk to your health that you have. Um, if somebody's wanting to reduce, obviously as long as there's no evidence of a physical dependency, if there's a physical dependence evident where people are having withdrawal symptoms, so that would probably be someone drinking more than 15 units a day on a regular basis for a, a, a prolonged period of time, there's a risk, there's a physical dependence. If they stop, there's a risk of seizure and death. So we don't advocate for that and we would recommend you get in touch with professional services to support you with a safe, gradual reduction plan. If you're a, a class as a high risk drinker, not dependent, increasing risk drinker, try and count, keep a drink diary and see how much you're drinking because you'll probably be surprised because the standard bottle of wine is nine units. That's pretty much three quarters of what your weekly guidelines are. Some people are having three, four, five bottles of wine a week. Um, try and reduce your intake, mix your drinks with a soda water, just so it's diluted. It doesn't mean you're drinking any less, but it means that your liver's not sat in pure alcohol. So if you dilute the drink, that's better for your internal organs. Um, try and have at least three days alcohol free a week and avoid massive binges where possible. Make sure you eat food as your friend. Okay. There's a, a Drink Away app that you can download for your smartphone, which has got loads of advice and health tips on reduction and um, making positive and healthy changes to your um, alcohol use and also that um, there was recently an NHS staff support um, for alcohol um, as well which is available on the Trust Internet page. And the other thing is as somebody you know when you don't drink there's often quite a lot of pressure on you isn't it? it's like why are you not drinking and you start getting the questions people look at you a bit like why are you not drinking mm -hmm. it's a really tough situation if you are well, for whatever reason you're not deciding not to drink that time it can be really hard to say i don't want to drink it's really tough isn't it yeah 100%. um like but it's the only drug you have to justify why you don't take no one comes up and you say why you're not taking heroin it's not a drug you have to justify it's pe people assume you can't have a good time without alcohol and i'll just actually reiterate the fact that you can I have an active social life i just i'm fairly a long way into my recovery so i could potentially do things that people in early recovery can't. If you're in early recovery, do not test yourself. Do not hang around people who are having alcohol. Do not go with, uh, with a spoons for your breakfast, go to Morrison's instead. Don't put yourself at risk. However, I'm five to six years in, so I might um, go somewhere with a friend and do a pub quiz, but I, do, I don't drink, and if I am at risk, I have a plan to get out. But they, if you're not alcohol dependent, they have introduced zero and low alcohol drinks because that's become quite um it's quite trendy. It's a healthy. Yeah, yeah. Avoid those if you're alcohol dependent or you're a high risk drinker. Do not do it. It's you, you will end up you, you, the chances of you relapsing on the back of having alcohol free alcohol is isn't significant. But their alternatives if you want to tell people that you're doing stop tober whatever it is or dry January, lots of people are in a health kit, you can describe it as you're looking after your your physical health, your mental health will be improved, your financial health, even when in a cost of living crisis, if you don't want to drink, tell people it's that or be honest and just say I'm having a drink for some time off. Yeah. Um, it's whatever you're comfortable with saying. And I know I've tried some of those um alcohol free or low alcohol beers mm -hmm. and they're 
they're all right actually yeah. some of them they're a lot better than they used to be yeah um and if that suits you great but your tip would be if it's if it's a bit of a concern for you to steer clear if you're a problematic drinker do not touch them it's you rather hide than nothing it's it's, it's good it's a recipe for disaster i promise you that Thank you for that tip. I'm sure that well, <laughs> other people listen to this will say that. Well, no, well, no, no, no people, people listen to that will we'll take that on board, yeah. and you know, you've had that experience yourself, and you're best place to talk about. Or drive when you go out, drive, take your car. Yeah. So there you go. It's a perfect excuse to start drinking yeah. driving. Um, I think sometimes people still try to give you a, a glass of whatever. Uh, yeah, what, uh, just uh, yeah, we, we that, that's, ha- that's happened to me before. Any alcohol when you're driving. Um and. I was going to move on to ask um, if anybody's concerned about their drinking or the amount of alcohol somebody they're close to is consuming, what help can you give them to, to support themselves and their loved ones? So there's the... lots of that was if they're in hospital they can ask to speak at the ACT team and we can go and see them. If they're in obviously in, at home in the community there is services within each area so within South Tyne Tyne we've got Adult Recovery, which is called STARS, and that's based in South Shields. And over in Sunderland, we've got We Are Recovery. And then in Durham, we've got Humankind, which we call HOPE. Um, if you put it into Google, all the details and contact number will come up and you can self-refer. They also, they provide support for carers and families as well. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the person that's drinking needs help, the, the family can get help and support as well. It'd be a really tough conversation though, isn't it? If you think somebody's got an issue and you've got to broach that without causing upset you just don't know how the conversation is going to go sometimes mm-hmm. so it is quite a tough one um i know that we've had some really brilliant feedback from people that we've worked alongside and their family and friends what kind of comments have you had and what difference does that make to you knowing that you've helped them i think a lot of the comments we've had is uh, people are I really like seeing a friendly face and having someone to actually talk to or who's listened to them when they've um, come into hospital obviously when they attend hospital they are unwell and it is a difficult time for them so having someone who knows a bit about their story and is able to guide them through that journey they really like that um, and I think some of the family comments that we've had back as well is obviously they've really liked having someone to ask and be able to give advice and support to and reassurance um, as well. So not necessarily just for the patient, but the the people who are surrounding them as well. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Colleagues as well have had good, really good feedback. Our colleagues, especially in AD in places like that, we obviously feel a lot of the pressure, and we we can support, we can with it as full colleagues as well. So if they've got any questions or anything like that, then they work behind us. Because I'm right in thinking, do you, does a member of your team join in the kind of morning meeting an AD in yeah. our emergency departments to yeah. to be part of that, so that if there's any anybody that can benefit from your support you're there and you're, you're involved in those conversations from the start yeah and we'll tell them normally what we're working hours are that day because obviously we're covering both sides yeah. um, and so we do say we're in till this time today and this is the number so then everyone's away normally when we come out the huddle <laughs> we're normally tapped on the shoulder yeah. on the way out saying we've got someone they've just come in and then we'll see them straight away yeah and if you, if somebody comes to us for care and the team think you're able to help them do you do you pick that up from there yeah 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 mm-hmm. we try to get the ad within the hour for care yeah so i like would have prioritized ad um first um because and then EA, the, the emergency yeah. wards after that um so that that's what what priority yeah to respond to but again it depends on our staff and pressures and who we've got yeah. in and covering t- across two sites because it's a seven day service as well which sometimes can be tricky with such a small team mm. but grow team thankfully yes. mm-hmm. so my last question is what is next for the team you've already mentioned you've got some new people joining in which will be fantastic but what are you looking to kind of build on and, and develop so over the next year we're looking to make some links within maternity services which I think will be really interesting um, so we're, we're busy working behind the scenes around that um, we're all really, really passionate about safeguarding, mm-hmm. so we're continuing to work with the safeguarding team um, and the domestic violence workers as well. Um, so I think just focusing on enhancing what we've already got um, and, and really embedding it within mm-hmm. the trust across both sides, I think, is just what's important. Excellent. Carly, you're working towards developing your career as well. Oh, what's next yes. for you? I'm, do, I'm doing um, my level three and then I'm hoping I can um, get the apprenticeship pathways to, to so I can become a registered nurse. That's the big dream. Fantastic. That's brilliant. Thank you both for joining us. I'm really grateful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for joining us for this episode of our People Podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. Check out our other stories. 
hit subscribe to keep up with the latest and catch up with what we've been up to on our Twitter, Facebook and Instagram pages. Just search for our name, 